Hello members and people of the podcast. Welcome back to Joan of Arc. Joan Thames, the madman. All children have nicknames. We had ours. We got one apiece early and they stuck to us. But Joan was richer in this matter. For as time went on, she earned a second and then a third and so on. And we gave them to her. First and last, she had as many as half a dozen. Several of these she never lost. Peasant girls are bashfully, naturally. Obviously bashful, but she surpassed the rules so far. And coloured so easily and was so easily embarrassed in the presence of strangers that we nicknamed her Bashful. We were all patriots, but she was called the Patriot because of our warmest feeling for our country was cold at the side of hers. Also, she was called the Beautiful, and this was not merely because of her extraordinary beauty of her face and form, but because of the loveliness of her character. These names she kept, and no other. The Brave. Just that one, actually. That was another she kept. We grew up in that plodding and peaceful region and got to be good-sized boys and girls, big enough, in fact, to begin to know as much about the wars raging perpetually to the west and north of us as our elders, and also to feel as stirred up over the occasional news from these red fields as they did. I remember certain of these days very clearly. One Tuesday, a crowd of us were romping and singing around the fairy tree and hanging garlands on it in memory of our little lost fairy friends, when little Mengette cried out, Look, what is that? When one exclaims like that in the way, that shows astonishment and apprehension. It gets attention. All the panting breasts and flush faces flocked together. All eager eyes were turned in one direction, down the slope towards the village. It's a black flag. A black flag? No. Is it? You can see for yourself that it is nothing else. It is a black flag, sure. Now, has anyone ever seen the like of that before? What can it mean? Mean? It means something dreadful. What else? That is nothing to the point. Anybody knows that without, without the telling. But what? What? That is the question. It is a chance that he that bears it can answer as well as any that are here. If you contain yourself till he comes. He runs well. Who is it? Some named one. Some another. But presently. All saw that it was Etienne Etienne Rose, called the Sunflower, because he had yellow hair and a round pockmarked face. His ancestors had been Germans some centuries ago. He came straining up the slope, now and then projecting his flagstick aloft and giving his black symbol of war a wave in the air, whilst all eyes watched him and all tongues discussed him and every heart beat faster and faster with impatience to know his news. At last he sprang among us, and struck his flagstick into the ground, saying, There, stand there and represent France, while I get my breath. She needs no other flag now. All the giddy chatter stopped. It was as if one had announced a death. In that chilly hush there was no sound audible but the panting of the breath-blown boy. When he was presently able to speak, he said, Black news is come. A treaty has been made at Troyes between France and the English and Burgundians. By it, France is betrayed and delivered over, tied hand and foot to the enemy. It is the work of the Duke of Burgundy and that she-devil, the Queen of France. It marries Henry of England to Catherine of France. It's not this a lie. Marries the daughter of France to the butcher of Agincourt. It is not to be believed. You've not heard aright. If you cannot believe that, 
Jacques d'Arc. Then you have a difficult task indeed before you, for worse is to come. Any child that is born of that marriage, if even a girl is, to inherit the throne of both England and France, and this double ownership is to remain with its posterity for ever. Now that is certainly a lie, for it runs counter to our Salic law, and so is not legal and cannot have effect, said Edmund Aubrey, called the paladin, because of the armies he was always going to eat up some day. He would have said more, but he was drowned out by the clamours of the others, who all burst into fury over the feature of the treaty, all talking at once and nobody hearing anybody, until presently, Hilmetha persuaded them to be still, be still, saying, It is not fair to break him up, so in this tale, pray let him go on. You find fault with his history because it seems to be lies. That for reason, for satisfaction, that kind of lies, not discontent. Tell the rest, Etienne. There is but this to tell, our King Charles, yes. King Charles the Sixth is to reign until he dies. Then Henry the Fifth of England is to be regent of France until a child of his shall be old enough to. That man is to reign over us, the butcher. It is lies, all lies, cried the paladin. Besides, look you, what becomes of our Dauphin? What says the treaty about him? Nothing. He takes away his throne and makes him an outcast. Then everybody shouted at once and said the news was a lie, and all began to get cheerful again, saying our king would have to sign the treaty to make it good, and that he would not do, seeing how he serves his own son. But the sunflower said, I will ask you this. Would the queen sign a treaty? disinheriting her son that viper certainly nobody is talking of her nobody expects a better of her there is no villainy she will stick at if it feed a spite and she hates her son the signing it is of no consequence the king must sign i will ask you another thing what is the king's condition Mad, isn't he? Yes, and his people love him all more for it. It brings him near to them by his sufferings and pitying that makes them love him. You say right, Jacques d'Arc. Well, what would you of one that is mad? Does he know what he does? No. Does he do what others make him do? Yes. Now, then. I tell you, he signed the treaty. Who made him do it? You know, without my telling, the Queen. Then there was another uproar. Everybody talking at once, and all heaping and bleeping away excretions upon the Queen's head. Finally, Jacques de Arc said, But many reports came that are not true. Nothing so shameful as this has ever come before. Nothing that cuts deep, so deep. Nothing to draft French so low. Therefore, there is hope that this tale is but another idle rumour. Where did you get it? The colour went out of his sister's. Joan's face. She dreaded the answer, and her instinct was right. The cure of Maxi brought it. There was a general gasp. We knew him, you see, for a trustworthy man. Did he believe it? The hearts almost stopped beating. Then came the answer. He did. And that is not all. He said he knew it to be true. Some of the girls began to sob. The boys were struck silent. The distress in Joan's face was like that which one sees in the face of a dumb animal that has received a mortal hurt. The animal bears it, making no complaint. She bore it also, saying no word. Her brother, Jacques, put his hand on her head and caressed her hair to indicate his sympathy, 
and she gathered the hand to her lips and kissed it for thanks, not saying anything. Presently, the reaction came, and the boys began to talk. Noel Rigwison said, Oh, are we never going to be men? We do grow along so slowly, and France never need as old as she needs them now to wipe out this black insult. I hate youth, said Pierre Morel. Call the dragonfly, because his eyes stuck out so. You've always got to wait and wait and wait, and here are the great wars wasting away for a hundred years, and you never get a chance. If I could only be a soldier now. As for me, I'm not going to wait much longer, said the paladin. And when I do start, you'll hear from me, I promise you that. There are some who, in storming a castle, prefer to be in the rear. But as for me, give me the front and on. I will have none in the front of me but the officers. Even the girls got the war spirit, and Marie Dubon said, I would, I were a man, I would start this minute. I looked very proud of herself and glanced about for applause. So would I, said Cecile Letelier, sniffling the air like a war horse that smells the battle. I warrant you, I would not turn back from the field, the wall England were in front of me. Pooh, said the paladin, girls can brag, but that's all they are good for. Let a thousand of them come face to face with a handful of soldiers once. If you want to see what running is like, here's little Joan. Next she'll be threatening to go for a soldier. The idea was so funny, and got such a very good laugh, that the paladin gave it another trial and said, Why, you can just see her, see her plunge into battle like any old veteran, yes indeed, and not a poor shabby common soldier like us, but an officer, an officer, mind you, with armour on, and the bars of a steel helmet in blush behind, and hide her embarrassment when she finds an army in front of her she hasn't been introduced to. An officer. Why, she'll be a captain? A captain, I tell you, with a hundred men at her back. And maybe girls. Oh, no common soldier. No common soldier business for her. And dear me, when she starts with that other army, you'll think there's a hurricane blowing it away. Well, they kept it up like that till he made the sides ache we were laughing, which was quite natural, for certainly it was a very funny idea. At the time, I mean. The idea of that gentle little creature that wouldn't hurt a fly and couldn't bear the sight of blood and was so girlish and shrinking in all ways, rushing into battle with a gang of soldiers at her back. Poor thing. She sat there confused and ashamed to be laughed at. And yet, at the very minute, there was something about to happen which would change the aspect of things. Make those young people see that when it comes to laughing, the person that laughs last has the best chance for just then a face which we all knew and all feared projected itself from behind the fairy tree. And the thought that shot through us all was, Crazy Benoist has gotten loose from his cage, and we are as good as dead. This ragged, hairy, and horrible creature glided out from behind the tree and raised an axe as he came. We all broke and fled this way and that, the girls screaming and crying. No, not at all. All but Joan, that is. All but Joan. She stood up and faced the man and remained so. We were crouched. We were hiding, and as we reached the wood, the wood that borders a grassy clearing and jumped into its shelter, two or three of us glanced back to see if Bionis was gaining on us. And that is what we saw. Joan, standing, the maniac gliding stealthily toward her with his axe lifted. The sight was sickening. We stood there, we were trembling, not able to move. I did not want to see the murder done, and yet I could not take my eyes away. Now I saw Joan step forward to meet the man, though I believe my eyes must be deceiving me. Then I saw him stop. He threatened her with his axe, as if to warn her not to come further, but she paid no heed, but went steadily on, till she was right in front of him, right under his axe. 
Then she stopped and seemed to begin to talk with him. It made me sick. Yes, and giddy, and everything swam around me, and I could not see anything for a time. For the longer brief, I do not know. When this time passed and I looked again, Joan was walking by the man's side toward the village, holding him by his hand. By his hand? The axe was in her rubber hand. One by one, the boys and girls crept out, and we stood there gazing open-mouthed, till those two entered the village, and were hid from sight. It was then that we named her the Brave. She kept that, you know. She liked it. We left the black flag there to continue its mournful office, for we had no other matter to think of now. We started for the village to a run to give warning and get Joan out of her peril. Though for one, after seeing what I had seen, it seemed to me that while Joan had the axe, the man's chance was not the best of the two. When we arrived, the danger was past. The madman was in custody. All the people were flocking to the little square in front of the church to talk and exclaim and wonder over the event. And it even made the town forget the black news of the treaty, for two or three hours anyway at least. All the women kept hugging and kissing Joan and praising her and crying, and the men patted her on the head and said they wished she was a man, they would send her to wars and never doubt. But she would strike some blows, and it would be heard of, they thought. She had a tear herself. She went away to hide. This glory was so trying to her diff diffidence. Of course, the people began to ask us, for the particulars, I was so ashamed that I made an excuse to the first comer and got privately away and went back to the fairy tree to get relief from the embarrassment of those questionings. There I found Joan. She was there to get relief from the embarrassment of glory. One by one, the others shirked the inquirer and joined us in our refuge. Then we gathered around Joan and asked her how, how she dared to do a thing. She was very modest about it and said, you make a great deal thing of it, but you mistake. It was not a great matter. It was not as if I'd been a stranger to the man. I know him and have known him long, and he knows me, and he likes me. I have fed him through the bars of his cage many times, and last December, when they chopped off two of his fingers to remind him to stop seizing and wounding people passing by, I dressed his hand every day till it was well again. That is all well enough, said little Mejit. But he is a madman, dear, and so his likings and his gratitude and friendliness go for nothing when his rage is up. You did a perilous, a perilous thing. Of course you did, said the sunflower. Didn't he threaten to kill you with the axe? Yes. Didn't he threaten you more than once? Yes. Didn't you feel afraid? No. At least not much. Very little. Why didn't you? She thought a moment and said, quite simply, I don't know. It made everybody laugh. Then the sunflower said it was like a lamb, trying to think out how it had come to eat a wolf, but had gave it up. Cecile Letelier asked, Why didn't you run when we did? Because it was necessary to get him to his cage, else he would kill someone. Then he would come to the like of arm himself. It is noticeable that this remark, which implies that Joan was entirely forgetful of herself and her own danger, and had thought and wrought for the preservation of other people alone, was not challenged or criticised or commented upon by anybody there, but was taken by all as a matter of course and true. It shows how clearly her character was defined and how well it was known and established. There was silence for a time, and perhaps we were all thinking of the same thing, namely, what a poor figure we had cut in that adventure, as contrasted with Joan's performance. I tried to think up some good way of explaining why I had run away and left a little girl at the mercy of a maniac armed with an axe. But all of my explanations that offered themselves to me seemed so cheap and shabby, that I gave the matter up and remained still. But others were less wise. Noel Rengisson fidgeted a while, then broke out with a remark 
which showed what his mind had been running on. The fact is, I was taken by surprise. This is the reason. If I had had a moment to think, I would no more have thought of running that. I would think of running from a baby. For after all, what is Theophile? Be honest. But I should seem to be afraid of him. Pooh, the idea of being afraid of that poor thing. I only wish he would come along now. I'd show you. So do I, cried Pierre Morel. If I wouldn't make him climb this tree quicker than, well, you see what I'd do. Taking a person by surprise, that way. Why, I never meant to run. But in earnest, I mean, I never thought of running in earnest. I only wanted to have some fun. And when I saw John standing there, and him threatening her, it was all I could do to restrain myself from going there and just tearing the livers and lights out of him. I wanted to do it bad enough. And if it was to do over again, I would. If ever come fooling around me again, I'll... Oh, hush, said the paladin, breaking in with the air of disdain. The way you people talk, a person would think there's something heroic about standing up and facing down that poor remnant of a man. Why, it's nothing. There's small glory to be got in facing him down, I should say. Why, I wouldn't want any better fun than to face down a hundred like him. If he was to come along here now, I would walk up to him just as I am now. I wouldn't care if he had a thousand axes and say. And so he went on and on, telling the brave things he would say and the wonders he would do, and the others put in a word from time to time, describing over again the glory marvels they would do, if ever that madman ventured to cross their path again. For next time they would be ready. They'd be ready for him, and would soon teach him that if he thought he could surprise them twice, because he had surprised them once, he would find himself very seriously mistaken. And so, in the end, they all got back to the self-respect. Well, they thought they'd got back the self-respect. Yes, and even added to it somewhat. Indeed, when the sitting broke up, they had a finer opinion of themselves than they had ever had before making all those stories. That's the end of that part. I appreciate you for still continuing to listen to the series of Joan of Arc. Do you remember she's still a child? very much a child still. Very brave indeed. Bless her. Thank you for listening. Many blessings.